So to, uh, to start off the day, we have a very distinguished talk from Mrs. Mirai Chatterjee. So just a little bit about her. She, after receiving degrees from the esteemed Johns Hopkins University and Harvard Universities, Dr. Uh, sorry, Mrs. Mirai Chatterjee joined the Self-Employed Women's Association, which is abbreviated as SEVA. She is currently the director of the social security team at SEVA. She holds responsibilities of SEVA's healthcare, childcare, and insurance programs. Addi additionally, she has been a member of several distinguished boards of several organizations in India and the world over. Most notably, she was appointed as a member of the National, Acad uh, National Advisory Council by the Prime Minister of India in 2010. It is such a pleasure to have you with us, and we are really excited to hear from you. I invite you on the stage. For your kind words of introduction, and I'm delighted to be here. Um, thank you for the honor of inviting me to address you here today. Um, and speak about uh, the journey of informal workers to take care of their own health and well-being. Um, I consider myself to be one of your biradari, one of your tribe, so I'm very happy to be here. I set out to be a marine biologist, but somewhere along the line I got diverted to public health. I guess the informal women workers of India hooked me for life. Um, just for those of us who may need a refresher on this, the informal economy uh, accounts for about two billion uh, workers worldwide, globally, according to the ILO, um, or 61% of the global workforce. If we speak about India, it's almost everybody. More than 90% of all Indians are, in, are informal workers, are engaged in the informal economy which is upwards of 500 million workers in this country. And if I speak of the women workforce, informal women workers, it's more than 94% of the workforce. We are considered not very productive, but we do contribute to more than 50% of India's gross domestic product. So let me introduce you to two of my Seva sisters, which will give you perhaps a flavor of the world of work they are engaged in. Sangeeta Ben is a small farmer in Lakhali village in Tapi district of South Gujarat and a Seva member. She joined a thousand of her other Adivasi or indigenous women sisters to set up the Megha Women Farmers Cooperative. She grows ladies finger or okra and sugar cane for a living. When she harvests the cane with her sickle, her back and shoulder hurt, but she cannot afford to stop working. She earns little from farming, and depending on her small plot of land makes her life very precarious. Last year, unseasonable rains washed away her lady's finger crop. The seeds cost a lot, and she had to borrow money from a money lender to buy a fresh stock. This has become more frequent, as you can imagine, due to climate change. She dreams of sending her daughter to college. Her daughter is good at studies and enjoys science subjects. Aisha sews garments in her home for a living. Perched on a stool, she sews for several hours at a stretch while her children are at school. Sometimes she has a headache and a backache, but she's a peace-rated worker and has to keep going so she can earn to feed her family. Her husband is a mason and work is hard to come by in the monsoons. She joined the Seva-promoted Abudana Craft Cooperative, which provides her regular work and income, more income than the contractor who was exploiting her and who gave her work earlier. There are millions of such informal women workers in our country with little or no work or income security, food security, or social security, or social protection as it's called these days, which means at least in our experience, healthcare, childcare, insurance, pension, and housing uh, roof over their heads with basics like water and sanitation, a tap and toilet in every home, the basics of life as we all know. 
and as most of us here enjoy. In addition to economic insecurity, our sisters suffer from discrimination due to their gender, caste, class, ethnicity, and religion. They are the most vulnerable of all Indians. It is to organize such workers into their own organization to fight poverty, injustice, and exploitation that the Self-Employed Women's Association was established 50 years ago by Ila Bhatt, a labor organizer and lawyer. Born into a family of freedom fighters, Ila Ben was deeply influenced by Mahatma Gandhi's call to serve the poorest of Indians in rural areas. Later, she joined the Textile Labor Association, which was founded by Gandhiji and a remarkable woman of her times, actually a scientist as well, called Anasuya Ben Sarabhai in 1918 in Ahmedabad, one of the first trade unions in the colonial era. It was there that she was first exposed, Ila Ben was first exposed to the world of work of the majority of the Indian workforce and especially women. Supabai, a head loader from the main wholesale cloth market in the city of Ahmedabad, approached Ila Ben in the late 1960s and said, carrying loads on her head for a pittance, she was not able to make a living and feed her children and send them to school. Moved by the plight of Supabai and other women like her who carried loads on their heads, Ila Ben began to organize these workers. Organizing is the process of uniting workers and building their solidarity for collective action and through their own collectives like unions, cooperatives, self-help groups, federations, and others, all membership democratic-based organizations of the women themselves. This first effort of organizing informal women workers, led by Supabai and Ila Ben, resulted in wage increases for the women and also led to a tripartite board with the labor department, the employers, and the women represented by SEVA, which continues till today and provides welfare benefits like scholarships for their children and insurance. At SEVA, we organize women on the basis of work and livelihood and include women from all castes, creeds, and communities. We were registered as a union five decades ago, as I mentioned, and now we are a national union with 25 lakh, that's 2.5 million members in 18 states from Kashmir to Kerala and from Gujarat to Nagaland and most recently in Assam as well. It's the first of its kind in India and, and maybe in the world. We soon realized that different strategies were needed when organizing informal women workers, most of whom were self-employed, for their rightful place in the economy and in society. When women said they needed financial services to free them from the clutches of money lenders, and when the nationalized banks would not open accounts for them 50 years ago, 4,000 women contributed 10 rupees each, their daily wage at the time, and with 40,000 rupees share capital, they registered their own women's cooperative bank way back in 1974, way before the microfinance movement was initiated or celebrated worldwide. Today, Seva Bank has over 6 lakh, that's 600,000 depositors, and working capital of over 6 billion rupees, all from the hard-earned savings of informal women workers, our members. Over its 50 years of existence, Seva Bank has helped lakhs of women to save, obtain loans for their businesses, and get access to other financial services like pension and insurance. As Seva grew, women said that they needed basic health care. They said Seva has helped us secure some level of income, and we have now our own bank and we save, but we still get sick a lot. They told us, our bodies are our only assets. As long as we are healthy and can earn, we can feed our families and hope for a better future for our children. The need for this and the gap in even basic health services for women and their families emerged starkly when Seva Bank conducted a study in 1977 of women who were not repaying their loans regularly. Most do, but some were not. The findings shocked us into taking action for health. Of 500 women surveyed, 
20 had died, 15 of them from causes related to childbirth. And among the rest of the women, sickness was the number one cause of indebtedness. We then began a maternity benefits initiative, always starting with ourselves. Each woman in Seva contributed some money to buy extra nutrition for women. And then the Gujarat government later took this up as a scheme for landless agricultural laborers and implemented it for several years. I joined Seva in 1984 to develop a community-based women-led primary health program for Seva's members and to address the huge gap in healthcare that emerged from the Seva Bank study. I studied history and science at university and planned to be a physician. Writing my senior thesis at college on healthcare in India, this was a while ago, about 40 plus years ago, I realized that it was not so much a paucity of doctors, but more that they were just not where they were most needed, in our villages and low-income urban settlements. In addition, we needed to address the causes of the causes of sickness, most urgently through public health action. So I trained in public health and joined the SEVA team to work among informal women workers. The first thing that struck me was the lack of scientific information among poor women on the body, on illnesses, on, on, and on how to stay healthy, although it was so important for them to stay healthy, as you have heard, especially given required, especially required given their meager resources and limited access to healthcare. My first six months were spent observing and learning in Shankar Bhuvan, an informal settlement on the banks of the Sabarmati River in Ahmedabad. Women in Shankar Bhuvan were all informal workers, street vendors, scrap metal collectors, domestic workers, and some cleaned used teens, tins for a living. They had been organized into our union and many had accounts in Seva Bank. Some had taken loans and developed their businesses. I also learned that in urban Ahmedabad at the time, people trusted their local healer or bhuva more than doctors or other health professionals. I witnessed some of the bhuva's practices in Shankar Bhuvan. Some quite scientific, I must say, like use of turmeric and herbs, and others were downright harmful. When a young woman was abandoned by her husband and her baby girl was taken from her, leading to depression, the bhuva made a fire with red chilies and made her inhale it to remove the spirit that had possessed her. Another young woman suffering from mental illness was locked up in a room and fed scraps that were thrown at her till we convinced her family that all she needed was love and care. Tuberculosis was widely prevalent, but people were afraid to get checkups and were not aware that free treatment was available. Despite our efforts, several women did not survive. When we linked up with the municipal authorities for free TB medicines, women said they did not have the time to queue up for these at the hospital. Who would bring the income to feed their children? And anyway, they couldn't afford food that was required, proper food when taking the antibiotics. I had been taught about the social, economic, and political factors influencing people's health in public health school, but here I saw it playing out in real life. Women told me, we would like to be clean, but our turn to bathe comes once in three days. Water is a problem here, and our toilet is the riverbank. We get up at dawn before our menfolk. The social determinants of health, or lack of these, like water and sanitation, could not have been more evident. Primary health care, and with the preventive focus, was the immediate need then, as it is today as well. Primary health care includes action on the social determinants of health, like clean water, toilets, nutrition, early childhood care, and more. Our members told us to start by educating them on health, and setting up a creche for their young children so that their children were cared for when they went out to work at the marketplace. We did both. Later, the creche we set up was taken over by the government's ICDS, or Integrated Development Scheme, and continues till today. 
a few of the women stepped forward to take health literacy classes. Of the first 10 health workers, only half knew how to read and write. It was challenging to develop ways to support their learning through practical demonstrations, repeated training sessions, and refresher sessions. It was a slow but exciting process of discovery and mutual learning. When we had a session on anatomy, we were surprised how much women knew. They said it was because they reared goats and ate them too. And yet, they had little scientific knowledge of reproductive physiology and etiology of common diseases like TB and malaria. Diarrhea and respiratory infections were an everyday occurrence among children, but there was little knowledge about early action to prevent dehydration or respiratory distress. I remember Suman Ben, a datan or toothbrush, traditional toothbrush vendor and my mentor, explaining how she felt after one of our training sessions. I've had six children but had no idea about my body and all that happens during pregnancy. How could I if no one ever explained this to me or shared this knowledge with me? She also told me, women like me have to have four to six children so that two or three survive. She was both student and teacher and soon began sharing her new knowledge with thousands of others like herself. Sharda, who was the young woman who had been locked up in a room, became one of our most active health workers. She said she found the will to live once she began helping others with her new knowledge and skills as a health worker. Women learned first aid and how to take care of the everyday illnesses they saw and when to refer and accompany their community members to a doctor for more care. Importantly, we set up linkages with public health hospitals so that women and their families got care and didn't have to waste a lot of time in long queues and save their precious monies. Along the way, we learned how to present scientific information on the human body and on diseases in a simple manner, demystifying medicine for local people especially women. These health workers began a program of health literacy in Shankar Bhuvan and soon similar health education and awareness was initiated in other parts of Ahmedabad and then rural areas as well by a growing team of enthusiastic health workers. There was Lakshmi and Aisha, Yasmin and Leela, all Seva members. Interestingly, we found that our health work encouraged more informal workers to come together, build their solidarity and organize because they found this service, healthcare, organized by SEVA was very helpful. And later they joined our health cooperative to work on health and other workers' issues. When we had a core team of 50 community health workers, we decided to form a health workers' cooperative. By 1990, Seva had several uh, cooperatives of artisans, farmers, dairy workers, and so on. But the cooperative department was somewhat confused when we showed up with traditional midwives, dais we call them, and health, local health workers, and asked us, how will you ever be financially viable? What will you sell? How will you raise revenues? We were faced with these questions, but we wore the department down after two years of discussion to register us as India's first health cooperative of local frontline health workers called Lok Swasthya Seva Health Cooperative. Soon after, a revenue generating opportunity presented itself because the women said whatever they were earning was going in medicines, the high cost of medicines. So they said to us, why don't you start up a pharmacy, a low-cost pharmacy? So with 70,000 rupees working capital, we began to provide low-cost, quality-controlled, and generic drugs to our members. We bought them from the wholesale market, and with a modest markup, we made these available to our members and anyone else. We also provided information on rational scientific drug therapy, simple do's and don'ts to women. Within a year, the counter not only paid for itself, but began making a small profit. Thus, by chance and by listening to our members, we found a revenue model for our health cooperative. 
Soon the municipal authorities asked us to replicate this model in their public hospitals and provided some seed capital. Our small experiment with low-cost medicines has now grown into a chain of three low-cost pharmacies come rational drug therapy education centers. Two of them are located outside large public hospitals in Ahmedabad and they are run round the clock and staffed entirely by women, our members' educated daughters. It also led our cooperative to become financially viable for the past 30 years. The profits financed some of our primary health care and health literacy programs. They also helped us, the profits that is, to finance and start up an Ayurvedic production unit. And we found that these were even cheaper and locally acceptable and with fewer side effects. Each batch of our formulations is quality tested by the Drug Commissionerate in Ahmedabad. And we also have a good manufacturing practices certificate. One of the challenges we faced in taking science and basic health care to informal workers was trust, and also that they preferred to adhere to their own belief systems. These were both for health and also other sociocultural beliefs. When we went into villages 40 years ago, women would take their babies on seeing us and disappear into the fields because they did not want them to be immunized. They had no faith in vaccination not unlike some of the barriers we faced recently during the pandemic. But today, in these same villages, all the children are now immunized, under five, that is. This is no doubt due to the enhanced public health efforts of our government, considerably strengthened from the time when we began our primary health work decades ago. But I think it will be fair to say that it's also due to the tireless contributions and ongoing efforts of the informal women workers, now health workers, for their communities. On another occasion, a young mother administered a little too much opium to her baby to keep her quiet while she harvested her wheat crop. The child could barely breathe. We had to act fast. One of the health workers did local crowdfunding, and with the monies, we convinced her family that it was not a waste of time and money to save the life of a baby girl. We had been active in that village for, for a while and had several members there who convinced the family and the little one was saved as we rushed her to hospital in time. After that, we never had to convince anyone in the village about timely health action and equal care for girls and boys. Bringing health care to local people by women and in a manner that is both appropriate both from people's point of view and that of science is not always easy. Tuberculosis has always been a top priority of our members. Somehow a doctor from the World Health Organization in Geneva sought us out and together we identified bottlenecks in the control of what our members called Raj Rog or King of Diseases. One of these was the opportunity cost of going to a facility to be tested and to obtain a regular supply of drugs even though these are free of cost at government facilities. Hence, our health cooperative developed the idea of running a diagnostic laboratory close to where TB was rampant, close to where the informal women workers lived and worked. WHO and the Ahmedabad Municipal Corporation was ready, but the higher authorities in New Delhi were skeptical. How can you have a lab located right near an urban slum? It took us two years of negotiation. It seems to take two years for everything. It took us two years of negotiation to actually implement our program. Finally, a lab was set up close to where women lived and worked. Young women from these areas were trained to look for bacilli through a microscope. And we kept stocks of TB drugs right near them, which were given out to people by a doctor. Local women seva leaders called agevans were trained to be DOTS workers in the government's then new DOTS program to fight TB. The DOTS workers were enthusiastic learners. They had barely finished high school, but their commitment was beyond doubt. They ensured that every TB patient took her or his daily medicines, often going to their home early in the morning 
crack of dawn actually, before people went out for work, tracking them down when they went to their villages, in the case of migrant workers, and monitoring them carefully till they were cured. In time, the results of their painstaking and tireless efforts began to show. It was a proud moment for us when the Municipal Corporation felicitated our team for having the highest case detection, case holding, and cure rate. We exceeded the standard cure rate of the WHO, and our defaulter rate was very low. Later, when more resistant strains were developed, the DOTS workers doubled their efforts. It showed what can be achieved if only we have faith in local people, especially women, their ability to learn and act collectively to deliver health outcomes. A similar struggle ensued when we started a school for training traditional midwives. Although the training course was supervised and run by an experienced gynecologist, we faced stiff opposition from local gynecologists who even threatened us with legal action. Most of the midwives or dais were not literate and had no numeracy skills but they had years of experience in delivering babies in their villages and were enthusiastic to learn scientific methods and to obtain new knowledge. We had the same gynecologists who opposed us take their examinations at the end of the course. All of them passed. The dais silenced their critics by their performance. Along the way, they learned to read and write as they needed these skills to take blood pressure, weight of pregnant women and abdominal circumference, and to note these down in their registers. Another area of health action was our work on occupational health. As we interacted with women as workers, and not just as mothers, we noticed the toll taken on their bodies by back-breaking work, and often with hazardous substances or processes, doing processes that often men would not do. Back pain and eye strain, and all kinds of other issues, tobacco and BD workers, almost always women, complained of breathlessness, loss of appetite, and eye strain. Women farmers spoke of body ache, and all of this was considered, oh, minor, these are not emergency conditions. Construction workers suffered from injuries and fractures regularly, and death by falling from heights was not uncommon. Yet these were hardly investigated by scientists. Uh, leave alone recommending ways to address these. Fortunately for us, the National Institute of Occupational Health is located in the city of Ahmedabad, where we are headquartered, and a fruitful partnership was initiated. Each of us brought our strengths to this partnership between scientists and informal women workers. Other partners were also fortuitously located in Ahmedabad, like the National Institute of Design and the Indian Institute of Public Health, Gandhinagar. So we worked together and developed equipment to address some of the issues women were facing. These ranged from gumboots and sunglasses for salt workers who toiled in the hot sun, and a sickle to cut sugarcane, which suited women's anthropometry and reduced body strain. It also included other equipment like hand carts for waste collectors, but unfortunately the cost of these continues to be a challenge and uh, we've not been able to convince the Labor Department's Welfare Board uh, to provide these on a subsidized basis. Uh, one of the things that a colleague here just reminded me is that we've also begun a new partnership with the University College London and I think support from the Wellcome Trust, if I'm not mistaken, doing action research on oral health, yet another neglected area um, of primary health care. Um, very little is known, we found out, about what are the oral health issues, leave alone women and formal workers, but what are the oral health issues of people at the grassroots in the global south. So I'm hoping I'll be able to share this with you at the next meeting. Finally, in the past year, we have been convinced about the power of taking science in a simple and understandable manner to local people and the ability of local frontline women workers to do this. Again, this was made very plainly clear to us during the pandemic, the corona, when the coronavirus first spread, and the need of the hour was for proper information to reach as many people as possible and for early detection and referral. Women did not shy away 
at all from this, uh, taking risk with their own lives to serve others. With technical assistance from the WHO, we trained 800 grassroots women leaders from 11 states to reach out to, to people door to door, educating, encouraging, and convincing them, dispelling their fears and misinformation, and supporting them for referral care with timely public health services. Fortunately, we had been working with local public health providers for several years, so we had a good rapport with them and were able to be useful at this difficult time. And within a month, these women digitally reached 300,000 households during the first lockdown and continued their good work for several months in those very challenging times. They also prioritized the poorest and weakest in their communities, the widows, the single mothers, the elderly, and the sick for priority action, providing food and medicine, but also ensuring that they were not left out of government relief measures. In addition, the Agevans, the local women leaders, provided emergency health services, kits with paracetamol, they learned how to use thermometers and oximeters for the first time, providing information on home isolation and care, reassuring sick, sick persons, and consoling those who had lost loved ones. One of the challenges we face when organizing health care for informal women workers and their families is the issue of high out-of-pocket expenditures on sickness. Women would repeatedly tell us that they needed to be healthy to earn and feed their families, but they could not afford the medical expenses if they got sick. These high expenses on treatment and medicines resulted in whatever little they saved being wiped out, and they frequently had to borrow or sell assets like a buffalo or even mortgage their land. The issue of risk coverage at such times, therefore, came up front. At a large gathering of workers, the women demanded insurance. We knocked on the doors of the nationalized insurance companies more than 40 years ago for insurance coverage. Just as they told us many years ago that women are not bankable, they told us you are not insurable. In fact, they told us you are bad risk. You die too much. Once again, our members showed that they are always ready to take risk when the mainstream institutions slam their doors on them. They resolved to start up their own insurance and raised a small fund, invested it, and used the interest for a mutual insurance program. At the same time, they kept up their efforts to convince the insurance companies that they were insurable. One woman manager finally agreed to take some risk with us. We began insuring women and their families for sickness, life, accidents, and asset losses. We did the legwork of explaining what insurance is, how it works, convincing our members to take out policies, claims processing, and maintaining the growing volume of data. The insurance companies partner, partnered with us and bore the risk. We're not allowed to be an insurer, full-fledged insurer, because the capital requirement is uh, 1 billion Indian rupees. In fact, we're in the process of convincing the regulator who sits right here in Hyderabad. Uh, over time, we developed our own products, provided them to our members as a mutual product for loss of income due to illness, and also convinced the large insurance companies to take up some of the products, uh, low, low premium products that we had developed together. More than 10 years ago, we registered our insurance company as a multi-state cooperative with members, shareholders from five states. The National Vimo Seva Insurance Cooperative, or Vimo Seva for short. It is the first such organization where women are the shareholders, policyholders, users, and managers. Through the women, the whole family can be insured. Today, not only are we profitable and serving informal workers in 10 states, but also our board is run by the worker shareholders. Asha Ben, a former garment worker, is the chairperson. And now she's an ace salesperson, earning five times than what she did as a home-based garment worker. She uses Vimo Seva's app to enroll women, collects their documents via WhatsApp, and then ensures that their claims monies reach their bank account directly. 
All these skills were enhanced during the coronavirus pandemic, and now women like her have fully adapted to using digital tools. Their lives, once fraught with insecurity, now not only have some measure of risk and financial protection, but they're also making a living from protecting other women like themselves. Universal health care and basic social protection like insurance, pension, housing, and child care is a dream yet to be realized in our country. However, informal women workers have showed over the years that they are ready to be part of the solution, providing health and insurance education, referral linkages, and joining hands with the public health system and private providers too when required for a better future for all. They're also learning to use digital tools and want to further their digital skills. There are several important lessons emerging from women's quest for basic health and social security. As I conclude, I'm outlining a few here for us to reflect on and then I hope act upon together. First, it is critical to invest our time and resources in taking scientific knowledge about health and well-being to the people. The pandemic and also the growing numbers of those suffering from non-communicable diseases and others has driven home to us the need for preventive, accessible health information and education. Interestingly, just before the pandemic, I found the book Key to Health, a slim volume written by Mahatma Gandhi in South Africa and then revised when he was in prison in Pune, in which he suggested quote, that we must in the first place know enough about the human body. I especially like his view, the human body is the universe in miniature. His book is replete with suggestions on what to eat and how, the importance of air, water, and self-restraint in our food intake and in all aspects of life. There are practical suggestions for well-being and a common vein running through the text is for us to take charge of our own health self-care and care of others, just as he often stressed self-help at the village level. We did not know of this slim volume when we began our health journey, but we found we're working in somewhat of a similar vein and with women in the lead as health educators. This continues to be the most important aspect of our primary health care work. It is painstaking and often seems repetitive, but it is the slow and steady work that few are doing, certainly not our public health system. What we learned from this health education work is that putting science in people's hands is empowering. Equipped with new information and knowledge, there's a spring in the step of our health workers come health educators. They are respected in their communities for all they know and for the services they provide in saving lives. Many of them have been asked to stand for election in the local self-government or panchayat or nagar palikas. One such seva sister is Chanchi Ben, a poor Dalit and disabled woman, a small farmer. When we chose her to be the health worker of her village, the men in the village were outraged especially the upper caste. She had hardly been to school, but she worked hard and developed into a competent health worker. Soon she was elected to the board of our health cooperative, and now her village leaders have asked her to stand for election as Sarpanch, or head person of her village. The second lesson is that health and well-being can be achieved, at least in part, through solidarity created through women's collectives. Chanchi Ben and thousands of others in the Seva movement only obtained voice, visibility, and validity through their own collective. Often, our Seva sisters say, who would know about us and our struggles? It's only through organizing, uniting, and building up our own organizations. And it's not just for visibility. It's also a practical way of reaching services and reaching the poor and in a transparent manner, reaching the last mile. Further, through collectives, women and other vulnerable sections of our society obtain strength, the encouragement they need to learn to break barriers, as my sister Chanchi Ben did, and even alter power relations in the family and in their communities. Collectives provide the opportunity for women to come together and learn on health, for example, and in a scientific manner, and then also begin to 
alter gender relations. Third, we have learned that when we place faith in local people, especially women, and their ability to learn and serve their communities, we are rarely disappointed. I'm amazed how much they enjoy Zoom and how quickly they've adapted to the digital world. These frontline workers are also learning about mental health and how to identify people needing support so that women suffering from, and others suffering from mental health conditions are no longer locked up. Fourth, uniting and forming their collectives like a health cooperative helps women address the social determinants of health. Uh, individually, it's impossible for them to advocate for a tap and toilet in their homes. But when they're together, for example, in Shankar Bhavan, the settlement I spoke of, we went and met the local corporator and convinced him to use his funds to put in a tap and toilet and basic sanitation in the community. Finally, we have seen that solidarity through women's collectives like health and insurance cooperatives is the key to health. It also results in inclusion, deepening of democratic functioning and decision making and participation especially of those who are usually forgotten or excluded, like informal women workers. When they feel they have both agency and knowledge, they feel empowered to act on all aspects of their lives, not least on their very health and well-being. Of course, there are many other factors to be taken care of, many other aspects. But ultimately, equipped with scientific information and their collective strength and bargaining power, women and local people can take control of and care of their most precious asset, their bodies and their health. Thank you. Uh, the life subsistence of these women working in these informal jobs and uh, giving us an awareness of the opportunities that we as scientists and educators have to make a difference in these women. So now I take this time to, uh, to give the opportunity to the, to the audience to ask any questions to Ms. Mirai Chatterjee. What an inspiring talk. No, no, please be seated. So uh, what a wonderful and inspiring talk. And uh, what uh, I was wondering, ma'am, regarding uh, that anecdotal story about the Dalit woman, initially the uh, upper caste people were you know, resistant to her, and now she's being uh, on her way to be elected as the Sarpanch. So uh, is that an uh, isolated or outlier story? Or in general, uh, the view of uh, you know, especially Dalit women or disabled women, is there more acceptance in those communities? Uh, by the virtue of the work that is ongoing and once they get formally trained and get incorporated into uh, places of power, like where knowledge hold powers, like uh, uh, the different cooperative bodies and societies. Thank you. Um, I think it's not an isolated case. Um, of course, one can't generalize, but uh, what we have seen is that when women are given opportunity, when they're provided with either information on health, or extension, agricultural extension workers or hand pump repairers, when they have this special skill that they get and knowledge, then they are much more widely respected in their communities. Um, and um, also what's very important, as I was trying to stress, is that they have the backing of their own collective, their own organization. Because individually it's very difficult for them to come forward in this manner. It takes, uh, it's a slow process, it takes a lot of capacity building, I couldn't say all of that in the time allotted, but it needs a lot of encouragement, because if all your life you've been told your brain is in your foot, and then suddenly you are encouraged to think and to serve others, uh, it takes a lot of time. But it isn't an isolated case, and I think we don't know enough, those of us who live in urban India, about the silent changes that are occurring in our villages and in our low-income communities. Thank you. Um, my name is Prashant. I'm from IPH Bangalore. I think I've met you. Um, thank you for a very inspiring talk. And um, your talk, uh, I, uh, from your talk, I wanted to hear your reflections on, on how can we derive lessons for academia, which, which seems to be um, 
um, relatively less self-critical than I would have liked, I think, because there is, there is um, a, a kind of a trajectory that academia sets for people which tends to push them more and more towards specialization and towards large university-based work. Um, but not necessarily that all academic work has to be based in these academic centers. There are several templates available where academic work can be more embedded within community settings. But we see less and less of uh, that kind of uh, trend. So I wanted to hear your thoughts and reflections um, on, on how, how, how could this be changed and what are your thoughts to academics on what should they be doing to, uh, to, to address one is gender, but also several other axes of inequities in society. Thanks. Ooh, that's a bit closing. I mean, we get a lot of young scientists and others who are willing to join hands and work together. We get a lot of young people. I'm looking at my colleague, Dr. Devaki, who came to us, who sought us out because they were looking for the experience of working at the grassroots and an experience of mutual learning. And as I mentioned, you know, a lot of times I think people are not aware of how they can contribute, people in academia. Um, for example, I mentioned the National Institute of Occupational Health. We're in the same city and they had, you know, till we sought them out and they sought us out and it's been a fruitful collaboration. Um, so I think closing the gap um, has to be done from both sides and that's part of the reason I'm here because I think that many a time people in academia don't know how challenging and intellectually stimulating it can be to work on some of these rather vexing issues of public health and science at the grassroots really. Um, and one example of this is an organization that we set up, the late founder of SEVA, Ilabhat, set up uh, called, it has a rather long name, Women in Informal Employment Globalizing and Organizing, WIGO for short. And it's a network of academicians, researchers, um, policy makers and practitioners, people actually working with informal workers on the ground. And it's now been in existence for more than 25 years and it's in more than 50 countries and several continents. And these are all people, you know, united to do what you said, closing the gap and work on how do we tackle inequalities and not necessarily scientists, but many are social scientists for sure. Um, and WIGO is growing. Uh, we just set up uh, in Kathmandu a network of home-based workers and there were representatives, it was exciting, there were representatives from 33 countries across the globe. Um, all women who work produce like garments, crafts and all from the home and who are among the most exploited. And there were many uh, researchers there and I just mentioned that, you know, it didn't even occur to me till um, friends from UCL, <laughs> London sought us out, I don't know how, and said let's work together on oral health. So I think as I said, it's from both sides. We have to, all of us have to be proactive. All of us have to be proactive, and there's so much to be done, and it's exciting. Sure, is active in 18 states of India. Why not every state? What, what is the barrier in the other 10 states? Good question. We get 0.5 million in a country of 1.4 billion, and the answer is that it's difficult to organize poor women. In a country like ours, my compatriots would know we are divided by every single division on this planet um, and more. Um, so uniting people is a very slow and steady and challenging process, number one. It takes time, especially women. One of the biggest battles is to get women out of their four walls. The men folk, their communities, you know, many of our members even had to suffer beatings just to come to meetings. Um, so it's not easy, is the first point. The second point is that we don't see ourselves as some kind of quote-unquote model that has to be you know, placed here, there, and everywhere in the country. We feel that it has to develop organically, and if local women, like say, uh, somebody in Assam or Madhya Pradesh or Kashmir would like to do similar work, 
then she can take that up with our fullest support. Because, you know, this is many different countries, as all of you know, really. And it's very difficult for us sitting in Gujarat to, you know, not only know all the languages of this country, but know the context and what would work and what wouldn't work. So I guess we have a long way to go. But in 50 years, this is what we've managed. And I think the important thing is we've managed to stay on course. And I think it's because of the values. And I think it's because of the women. We're inspired by the values of Mahatma Gandhi. And in one, in a nutshell, you know, it's women, work, and peace. That's what we're about. Thank you.